Hello and welcome to another edition of Surviving Scientology Radio with your host Jeffrey Augustine. Today we have back with us returning guest Janice Gillum Brady, author of Commodore's Messenger, a child adrift in the Scientology Sea Organization. Janice, welcome oh, to the show. Oh, thank you, Jeff. How are you? I'm doing Good. great, thank you. Look forward to look forward to our interview, ja- Janice. Where can people get your book, Common Earth? Um, they can get it from Amazon.com and also Smashword and through those are where you can get it online. And then right now they're going to be setting up other distributors to get it into regular bookstores and other places like that. But it gets released on the first of August, and those are the places you can get it on an immediate basis. Well, I look forward to reading it. I've read parts of it you sent me, and it. It's an exciting read, but there's also a lot of a lot of uh, heartbreak and pain. Yes, there is. You call your mother Yvonne. Yvonne Gillum started the Celebrity Center. How was she as a mother? Well, when we were together, she was a very good mother, and that's why it it's very hard to understand as a mother uh, how one could desert their children, and though she petition many times to have us join her it was denied and she accepted that Uh, myself having been a mother uh, when I would look at my kids when they were the age I was on the ship or my brother and sister you know I I would look at them and go what was she thinking see that's the culture of the Church of Scientology is that everyone in a Sea Org member has a duty and they're a Satan who's billions of years old, so they're really there's really not right. Family. Correct. And you know it's funny because I even found at the time, you know, I wouldn't know it, or in talking to my then find out, there were other women on the ship who had left their children behind. Uh, Kimma Douglas was one of them, and she had left her daughter when she was like maybe six years old, and the grandparents ended up raising her until Kimma finally left the Sea Org and went and retrieved her daughter and rebuilt her relationship with her, having realized what she'd done wrong. And Kimma had been a good friend of my mother's, and I'd talked to her over the years as to why would my mother be doing this. And Kimma's like, well, I was in the same boat. I did the same thing with my daughter. And in the late 60s, you've got to remember, the Iron Curtain was up, there was concern of war with Russia. Meanwhile, Vietnam is going on, the atomic bomb has come out. So here we hear about Scientology and freedom, and that we can do something to make this a better place for our kids in the future. So you put the kids on the sideline and you jump in there to try and make it a better place for them. And that is how Kimma justified it to me that on how she was able to leave her daughter behind and felt the same thing with my mother who she'd had many discussions with her about that. The stories are legion of parents basically abandoning their children in Scientology because they feel they're they need to rescue mankind. Hubbard had a lot of a lot of pressure on Scientologists that the world was about to end at any given time by thermonuclear warfare, and only Scientology stood between Armageddon Correct. and salvation. Correct. He heavily pushed that. You know, I grew up in the Christian church, and the idea that the rapture was imminent was a big idea. I mean, it was being pushed all the time that Armageddon was coming, the rapture was coming, and so you had to put all these kind of things aside, but you, you, you didn't break up your family. The reason I, I make this point is right now on Twitter, that Scientology is waging a war in which they're saying that disconnection doesn't exist. In fact, one Scientologist, a Sea Org member, says Scientology doesn't break families apart. It brings them closer together. Yeah, well, that's a lie. It, well, it's, it's, it's propaganda. Scientology does break families apart. They do recruit young children into the Sea Org. They do separate yes. families. People who have been through the nightmare of the Church of Scientology know that. And the Church of Scientology can lie about it all at once, but it doesn't make it any less true that they do break up families, that disconnection exists. A family can be in Scientology, and yet its members can be separated by Sea Org, by duty assignments, in various ways as you were from your mother, you and your siblings. One thing I wanted to ask you about, L. Ron Hubbard, if you look at Scientology websites, he's made to look like a bachelor. <laughs> Except for, it, it looks like, 
L. Ron Hubbard was married three times and had seven children, okay? But if you go on the Church of Scientology website, you see no mention of his wives or children. All you see is one obscure line saying, after leaving a modest bequest to his family, L. Ron Hubbard gave the bulk of his estate to the Church of Scientology. That's it. Millions of words Hubbard wrote. You know, Mary Sue Hubbard has been expunged. She's been edited yes. out of tape. And, and that, that was David mentioned. Miscavige's order to have any mention of Mary Sue and the family edited out of the tapes. I, I did not know that. But he, so they've been purged from Scientology history, as has Correct. been your mother. Yeah, I, you I heard find some interview by Tommy Davis or somebody who was talking about the founding of, Scient of uh, Celebrity Center and... It was all oh, a bunch of celebrities got together and they wanted to put a, you know, start in their own place. Nah, that's not what happened. No. No, and we'll get we'll get to that. But first, let me ask you about L. Ron Hubbard's own family. When you were on the ship as a member of the Commodore's Messenger Organization, Mary Sue Hubbard, what was her duty and role on the ship? What was your relationship to her? What was her relationship to L. Ron Hubbard? In other words, who is Mary Sue Hubbard in Scientology? Now, Mary Sue was second in command of all Scientology. When when Hubbard was sick or when he was gone, she ran everything. So that was her power. She was also um, the controller, and she was responsible for running the Guardian's office, which was located in England at Worldwide. Um, she was a officer on the ship. She, when we went out to sea, she had watch duty and she would be a conning officer and in charge of a sea watch. She was also L. Ron Hubbard's wife. Every day when uh, he got up and went up to his office for breakfast, he went up to his office and they'd get breakfast ready and put it down for him. She would always come in and she'd give him a kiss on the forehead or the cheek and uh, say, good morning, honey. And then she would sit down and chat with him while he ate breakfast. She'd sometimes eat her own breakfast with him. Yeah, so that they had a very good relationship. And they both worked hard and they both worked yeah, a lot of hours. Yeah, she, she did, you know, we had Liberty, like every Liberty being time off to go ashore. We had that um, every two weeks. She took that time. She would go with her assistant or with Diana, her, her oldest daughter, and they would go ashore and She'd take the kids shopping sometimes. Uh, there was a time she went to Zurich with Diana to get her dresses because she was going to Los Angeles for a convention. L. Ron Hubbard and Mary Sue had four mm -hmm. children, and they lived Correct. on the ship. Did they get special treatment? Sometimes yes, sometimes no. There was times they were just like the regular crew. Um, but there, also, there was a time period when they got to eat with their parents. Sometimes that was bad news for their bosses. You know, they might innocently tell something to their dad, and then the next thing you know, there's a bunch of message runs going on, you know, because he would, he would find out different things of what's going on around the ship when he'd talk with the family. You know, the kids, yeah, they did have a few things better than everyone else, like their own room they didn't have to share, but generally they were just like anybody else on the ship. Quentin, who, who tragically committed suicide at a young age, what was Quentin like? He was a fun-loving guy. He loved airplanes. He used to pretend he was an airplane as he'd run down the passageway with his arms out, making a engine-type noise. Um, he was fun. Yeah, and I, and I think most people who, who knew him genuinely yes, loved him. he was him. a very caring person. Were you still in the Sea Org when, when he took yes, his own life? I was in Clearwater at the time. And now, was it, was it kept secret, his suicide kept secret from the church? Well, I don't know what you mean by kept secret. Um, well, well, did the general membership know that, that Quentin Hubbard had killed himself? You know, I, I couldn't answer that because I was on the inside. I don't know on the outside what was said. The Guardian's office handled all that. Um, I don't know what announcements were made. I was told about it. I mourned him and moved on. Going back to L. Ron Hubbard, L. Ron Hubbard had painted himself as a, a World War II combat hero. And the claim is between 21 and 28, you know, medals. He'd painted himself as a nuclear physicist, which he was not, a PhD, civil engineer, 
Doctor of Divinity. What did you believe all of that about Hubbard when you were serving him? Did you know about these? No, claims? I didn't know about those claims. That those claims weren't really discussed. Um, you know, he might mention here and there. You know, we'd be talking about Australia because that's where I came from, and. He joked that if it wasn't for him, I'd be speaking Japanese. He was down there on a sub chase, and when the Japanese came down uh, to try and take Australia, and he chased them off. So that's the story he told me. He did claim to be the senior officer ashore, senior U.S. officer ashore in Australia, which was not correct. But nevertheless, so he, he that was downplayed on the ship. You were dealing with L. Ron Hubbard. The correct. Human, and you know what was amazing is... Know. Well, I lived on the ship for five years before I went and mingled with, with regular Scientologists. Um, my sister and I went to Los Angeles for a three-week vacation, Los Angeles and Phoenix, to see our parents in 73. And I was amazed at the reaction and the view that people had of Hubbard. You know, to them, he was very godly and could walk through walls and, you know, pick up pens using his just intention. And it was, it was a whole new concept to me, having worked directly with him as a man and then seeing these people thinking of him as a god. Yeah, that would be a big disconnect. You know L. Ron Hubbard, the man, and yet the, the legend he became in his right. own church. That would be quite extraordinary. Now, you, you mentioned to me when we were talking once that L. Ron Hubbard had, had a temper. Yes. That he would frequently yes. yell. Talk to us about that. What, how did his temper manifest? Was it volcanic? Would he get mad at small things or important things? Or How did that manifest? Uh, he'd get mad at small things, and it was volcanic, both. So he would blow yes, up and explode. Yes, and he would calm down very fast. As soon as he knew it was handled, he'd calm down very fast. And he wouldn't then walk around still grouchy about what he was upset over. He was done with it. Janice, L. Ron Hubbard wrote quite a bit, but on the ship you had mentioned he didn't use a typewriter. Did he write, write out? Yeah, uh, it was hand? all longhand. Uh, he would sit there, you know, and he used different color pens depending on what he was writing. If it was technical for Scientology, he used a red pen. If it was administrative policy, he used a green pen. He used different pens, and it made it easier then for the Mimeo typist. And it was all handwritten. It wasn't until um, oh later when we moved ashore, I guess it must have been about 77, when he started using a typewriter to write um, the movie script, Revolting the Stars. Before that, he wasn't typing much. L. Ron Hubbard in the 1950s, even that going back to actually 1945, started using a sound scriber dictation machine. And a lot of his early work through the 50s was done on a dictation machine because it saved so much time. And then transcriptionists would put it into written form. Did he use a dictation machine? Yeah, machine? he did. Not a lot. And he had a transcriptionist. Uh, but it wasn't a lot. He mostly wrote his own stuff. L. Ron Hubbard is the embodiment of the Church of Scientology. When you're dealing with him as a Scientologist, and he's the, the living embodiment of the Church of Scientology, do you factor that in, this is the guy that wrote OT3, or do you look at, this is my boss and I've got a work day ahead of me? <laughs> no, I, I would, you know, it's funny. Um, yeah, sometimes I might think, you know, well, what is so big about OT3? Because I didn't know what it was. Uh, but it did, I couldn't put together his temperament. If he was so great and achieving all this, why did he have this temper? I could never figure with that. Mm -hmm. And as a kid, when I would go on watch, before I would go into report for duty, you know, I would kind of mentally set myself up as to, okay, I'm going to pull off this watch, I'm not going to get yelled at, it's going to be really smooth, and, and I'd have to set myself up mentally to go in there and make sure everything was smooth while I was there, and then I'd pat myself on my back when my watch was over if it was smooth the whole time. So I can imagine, so you don't know what to expect on right. any given day. Janice, you spent 10 years of your life from 
what, age 11 to age 21 with L. Ron Hubbard? Um, yeah, 1968 until uh, the end of 1979. 11 years yes. with L. Ron Hubbard. And, and you're with him on a daily Pretty basis. Pretty much, yes. So you know him as well as anyone else. I, I knew think. how to approach him, and I knew how to deal with his anger, and I knew how to do message runs to work it to keep people out of trouble. So, yeah, you'd have to learn how, how to work with the man. You would know what Correct. would set him off, and you would also know how Correct. to appease him. After all these years, after all the years you spent with Elron Hubbard in the decades to think about him, do you feel that you understand L. Ron Hubbard, or is he a mystery to you? In no, he's not a mystery to me. How would you describe, what's your summation of him based on your experiences and your decades of reflection? He was just a person. He was another person who had high hopes of doing something to help the world, but he didn't have all the answers, though he thought he did. Now, when Hubbard said he thought he had all the answers, this is really interesting to me because he, he represents himself. At one time, he tries to float this kind of Fabian campaign that he was the reincarnation of the Buddha. Did you ever yeah, hear of that? Um, yeah, with the him, when they released the Hymn of Asia, that was the first time I'd heard that. He himself had never really said it to me, but he'd written it in other papers. Was he pretty consistent in his dealings with his messenger? Was It was business. He didn't get transcendental with you. He never said, I'm the reincarnation of the Buddha, or he never intimated no, that. No, not to me, he didn't. And, you know, he talked about past lives and, you know, having been in this war and that war and talking about life on different planets and having sailed the seas and... You know, we'd be sailing into Tangiers and he'd say, oh, this is where the pirates used to come out and attack these ships. So, you know, he would tell different stories and you just didn't know, was he making it up or was this really his track or did he read about it? You, you didn't know, but he huh. seemed to know everything. And it's interesting because as the years went on, originally he was the founder of Scientology. Other people had already documented and figured things out and he's the one that founded it he found it and then kind of put it together so that people could use it to improve their lives and then as time went on and again this is after the motorbike accident he changed himself from being the founder to being source and that he was the creator of it all and it was a whole mm. different mentality now going through his head and as the years went by I could see it switching over from where he comes out with false data stripping, where someone is sat down and they have to, it's believed that they have false information about something and therefore that has to be stripped out and they have to be re-educated. So let's say someone learns how to look after an apple tree. Well, LRH might have written something about apple trees. So you do false data stripping and you get them to realize where they learned all this wrong information about growing an apple tree and taking care of it. And then you have to take the LRH information and you re-educate them. And this is how you really take care of an apple tree. And even though LRH might not have been an expert on apples, you have to take that information and replace what the person knew with what LRH knows. So over time, the indoctrination becomes yes. heavier. What's interesting is as the Apollo began to be kicked out of ports in the Mediterranean, L. Ron Hubbard makes a decision that he has to come ashore. Uh, that's, we first that, go from the Mediterranean to the Caribbean, and we spend a year in the Caribbean before we move ashore. True. Now, the, the story I've heard is that the ship is headed to Charleston, and you are warned by radio that the FBI and IRS are waiting on the dock yes. in Charleston. Yes. So you radio that you're going to go to Nova Scotia for parts, and yet you turn the other way and yes. go down to the Caribbean. Yes. What's that last year like in, in the Caribbean? You know, we just sailed port to port, and um, he started doing um, his photo shoots. And when he, you know, when he did different projects in the hobby horse like with the musicians or on the photo shoots it gave a breather to the other the other organizations 
because his attention was no longer on them and they could kind of get on and do their job without him constantly questioning them. And, you know, like even, even with the musicians, he, he'd be telling the drummer, who's a trained drummer, how to drum. And I'm like, wait a minute, LOH has never drummed. I've never seen him play drums. And then he would say, well, I used to be a drummer in a past life, and this is how we did it. <laughs> past lives gives you a lot of authority. Right. Right. When you're, right. When you're, particularly when you're L. Ron Hubbard. So, okay, so the ship comes ashore. Yeah, and the reason beach. for that, you know, I've heard various different reasons from people, but this is what was actually going on at the time. We had been kicked out of a couple of ports, but there was still, still plenty of ports there that we could have gone to. But Mary Sue at the time wasn't that well, and... LRH had been in a hospital in um, Curacao. And, uh, for what was he hospitalized for? Heart issues. And I, and I go into all that in my book. But he, he was in intensive care. It was a hit or miss on if he was going to make it. And as messengers, we just sat outside that intensive care, you know, doing nothing but twiddling our thumbs, wondering what was going to happen. And then he finally came out of it. And it, it was at that point where he and Mary Sue had a discussion, and she didn't want us to be at sea, and something happened to him. And, oh, and so that's yeah. when she was like, let me get the Guardian's office on to finding some place for us to move to. You know, this is interesting. You would say this, Janice, and I'll tell you why. As, as people get older, and especially as they start thinking about retirement, they start thinking about, well, maybe I should be somewhere near where there's very good medical care as I get older and think, head right. to retirement. And so obviously if Mary Sue's not not doing well health-wise and Ron's not, they're thinking they better, yeah, it doesn't make sense to be at sea because if you're at sea and he has right. a heart attack, he could, right. di he could die. See, and, and so that was Mary Sue's view, but LRH's view was he wanted to move ashore so Mary Sue could have a bit of a regular life and not have the, you know, she, she was never into ships. And, and he wanted to give her a better lifestyle rather than just going between a deck and the prom deck. And I could see that. Yeah, that's like, because uh, that's a marriage and she's had 10 yeah. years on the ship. Yeah. And so they, they go to Daytona Beach. This is where the, the United Churches of Florida Scientology Front yes. Group begins Covertly, covertly buying properties in Clearwater by the Fort Harrison Hotel and a bank building well, and some first, other things. The first and thing was the Fort out. Harrison and the bank building. Those are the first two buildings that we purchased. Now, now they were purchased for cash. Yes. And was it true that, now I, I've heard, I've read online, and again, I don't know if you know, but I'll ask you, did... Mary Sue and Ron Hubbard usually have one or two million dollars in cash on the ship in the city. You know what? Uh, I don't know how much they had personally. I do know that in the safe in Hubbard's cabin, he had um, several million that was company money. And, and this is uh, American dollars or different, different currencies? So L. Ron Hubbard had several million dollars in currencies just on yes. the ship. Yes. Two things I want to ask about the Apollo before we move on to uh, Clearwater. Hubbard locked children and other people in the chain locker. Yeah. As, for, as a form yeah. of punishment. He, he did, did not he, do it did, personally. He had other people do it. Well, yes. but, it but he ordered it. Yes. What did you think of that kind of treatment? It was a treatment that I worked very hard to make sure it never happened to me. I mean, did it cause you any kind of conflict with Hubbard why is why would he lock a, chi a child in a chain locker well I never ran any messages on that so it, in my head yes I couldn't understand it but he had it all justified I, I can imagine and you're basically indoctrinated into this culture what about the overboardings on the ship um, what about them yes they they happened uh, they were his orders and it got out of control and um, he was, I, I even got thrown over. What happens in an overboard? You know, Walk us through that. It's, a ceremony is held on the aft well deck, and they open up the, the uh, rail, the gate, 
and um, the chaplain is there along with the MAA, and people are mustered, and the people who would be thrown overboard are called forward, because you don't know ahead of time unless somehow you got up and you saw the oods, the orders of the day. And uh, the chaplain would take your watch and your shoes or anything like that that you didn't want to have go in the water with you, and he would then say, commit your sins and errors to the deep and hope you arise a better Phaeton. And then two people would step forward and pick you up and throw you over. Now, it was like 30, 40 feet It was, down. Um, let me think, the equivalent of maybe two decks. So 20 feet? No, 18, 18 feet? I mean, 18 feet. Well, I mean, was it a terrifying ride down or was it just something you You know, if you to? didn't know how to swim... Or if you hadn't jumped from there, it would have been terrifying. I've, I saw terror, you know, or people just having a grin and bear it. It was from um, a level that we used to swim over the side of the ship, and we used to jump from there all the time. So as a kid, it was no big deal to me. But to a lot of other people, it was a big deal because they'd never dealt with that height before in going into water. Now, Janice, when the Church of Scientology buys the Fort Harrison, do you move? Do you, as the CMO, move into the Fort Harrison, or do you stay with Mr. Hubbard? Who's yeah, you know the the guardian's office did not want him to move into the main base until things had settled down and they saw that everything was smooth. So instead of him moving into the Fort Harrison. Um, the King Arthur's Court in Dunedin was rented. And he moved there, and the messengers moved there, and the household unit moved there, along with Mary Sue. And, so, and that, makes, that makes sense to keep yeah. security in for Hubbard. Now, as I understand it, Hubbard never actually resided in the no, Fort Harrison. No, he never did. He, he drove by uh, it. Yes, he did. Yeah. Apparently. Were you running message traffic from apartments over to the flag lamp? No, everything was um, pretty much put in writing. So we didn't run a lot of messages unless it was to someone within the household unit. But we'd, we'd started taking a lot of notes and we'd help with the external comm typing things up and getting mail into what we called the red ball and the green ball. That was a van that would go between the... Um, Dunedin and the Fort Harrison and would take the dispatches back and forth, the mail. Okay, so you're, you're handling a, lot, a, a high volume of message traffic for, for Mr. Hubbard. When is the decision taken by L. Ron Hubbard to go west to California to, to purchase the two Well, bases? first off, um, I guess it was early March, late February, early March in um, Clearwater, when so someone, it was a reporter, I believe, got into the Fort Harrison, went up to the 10th floor and found up in the ballroom, there was a little office up there and found a dispatch that indicated we were Scientologists. And so he blew open the story. And that's when LRH took off to Washington, D.C. with Kimmer and Michael Douglas. And he was in D.C. for a few months and Jim didn't join him. Then closer to the middle of the year, once the GO had, had gotten him a place in California to stay in an apartment complex, he then went out, out west. He called the city at an apartment complex. When I showed up there and saw that place, I was amazed. I'd never, I'd never been around the outside world, like in Los Angeles as an apartment complex or anything. So I was amazed to see thousands of people living in this complex, you know, all out by the pool and you're walking past them in the hallways. And I'm like, wow, it was, it was a whole different lifestyle for me to see this. And he had his own apartment with Mary Sue and the, his, the crew that were assigned there were all bunked up together. I happened to be working um, as a relay point, so I was in LA working out of the Guardian's office, external comm, to as a middleman to receive communications and take them to the complex where he was in Culver City. Now that's just that's just really fascinating. Now see, Hubbard could live in ship's quarters. He could live in a a manor in England. He could live in an apartment in Culver City. 
And this goes to the point that he had to stay yes. Fabian. Yes. Now, what does Fabian mean in Scientology culture? Help us understand why, what Fabian is and why Hubbard observed that. Well, policy. you know, it was always felt to keep him safe because he was the person doing all the research for everyone's future to allow all, everyone to become free and to make it a better world. He was the man uh, hitting the charge. So that is why the Scientologists would come behind him and protect him. So really it was set up to protect the source of the Scientology religion yes. from, from not just external attacks, but internal attacks as well. Yes. And, but on a more practical level, people wanted to sue Scientology. They wanted to sue L. Ron Hubbard. The IRS Criminal Investigation Division was looking into him for income tax evasion and other things. So he had a lot of reasons to Correct, stay in Correct, but that was more, you know, the, the, the mentality of the Scientologists or the SEALD members was not that he had evaded paying taxes. It was that the IRS is trying to take down Scientology doing a good job for the world, and therefore we have to protect him. I'm glad you said it because that gives us insight in, in, into the two ways of thinking. If you're a Scientologist, you have to protect the Commodore who's the source of right. the technology. Right. And, and I remember reading Scientology publications back then that the IRS was making all of these unwarranted criminal attacks on Scientology because it had the secrets of, of letting people right. go free. And that's important for our audience to understand. When you're outside the church, you're seeing, you know, reporters talking about what the IRS is saying or different lawsuits or threats of lawsuits. But when you're in the church, you're not reading the newspaper. No, no, you have no, no yeah, you, you have no idea what's going on in the outside world. You'd been in a very insular Scientology only environment for eight years on the ship. And then suddenly you're in this massive apartment complex in Culver City. Yeah. So that, again, that also shows the disconnection between what's going on out here in the world and inside of Scientology. Yeah, you're, you're like a country bumpkin going into the city. Well, I don't know. I, I, maybe that's the wrong term. You're in a high security environment doing what you think is going to help change the yes. world. And then suddenly you go, you go out into this large world you're trying to save and see just how big it really is and how fast right. it really but moves. But you don't know how it really operates, except for what you've heard. Yeah, because L. Ron Hubbard and the Guardian's office has told you it's a dangerous Correct. environment out there. And the only safe place is Scientology. Correct. Does Hubbard move from Culver City? Do you guys get the bases down at La Quinta? Yeah, that's where he moved to. Or what I, I actually, when he moved to La Quinta from Culver City, as I said, I'd been in L.A., so I returned to Clearwater at that time. Well, they, but, well, the Culver City people all moved to La Quinta and were setting up the properties there. And then later on, it wasn't until about April 77 that I left Clearwater and went to La Quinta and joined um, some of the other messengers and him. Janice, because you're CMO in the church, uh, and you're dealing with the Guardian's office. What's the relationship of CMO to the Guardian's office? Yes. Were there conflicts? I mean, did the Geo hate you the know, CMO? I don't know what they thought of us. But do they become your enemies? Is there is there a state of enmity or tension between the two units? That does become later later on. Yes, that does happen. But at the time, we had nothing to do with the Guardian's office really, except for when they moved to. West, the West Coast. When we moved to America, actually, it was the Guardian's office who kind of became the protector. And through Mary Sue, she finally had control of LRH's environment, where LRH depended on the SEAL, Mary Sue depended on the Guardian's office. And when we moved to La Quinta and Culver City, the Guardian's office had set that all up. And they their security was very different than how we'd operated in the Sea Org. And that's when life histories came about, where crew, anybody going to La Quinta had to fill in a life history and get sec checked, where that was different to when we were on the ship or at the base. And this was with the GO trying to control who is around Hubbard. 
Now that's interesting. You said that Mary Sue's power depended upon the Guardian's office. L. Ron Hubbard's depended upon the Sea Org. Right. So essentially you have the Sea Org is at odds with the Correct. Guardian's office. And you found now, that also out in the organizations, because later on as I got older, I went out to um, some of the organizations on missions, and I would find executives who had been trained on the ship and had been sent back in order to run the organizations were no longer in executive positions. They had been replaced by untrained people and moved to the Guardian's office. All of this blows apart. What happens when the raid on the Church of Scientology occurs on July 8, 1977 in program Snow White? I mean, what did you think when you heard? <laughs> it was like, uh, OMG, and um, we had to we had to get him out of there because it was like, were they coming after him next? Well, you know, well, and he he would keep saying he didn't do anything, he doesn't know anything. You know, Mary Sue runs the Guardian's office, so he would claim ignorance. But you know, we weren't stupid. We would know that every time they were at dinner together, if a messenger walked in the room, Mary Sue would stop talking. And when we left, mm. she would talk again. So we knew that she was briefing him on stuff, but we didn't know what it was. Where was L. Ron Hubbard physically on the morning of the raid? Um, he would have been at Rifle, which was one of the properties in La Quinta. And when that happened, he immediately got a bag packed, and um, three messengers went with him, and they drove up to Sparks, Nevada. Yeah, that's an interesting period of time. So you've got to get L. Ron Harbor the right. hell out of Dodge because you don't know if the FBI right. is going to get him next. And they go up, and again, this is another thing I find interesting about Hubbard. You guys go up, the CMO takes them up to Sparks, Nevada, and they Correct. run an apartment. This is so low-tech genius that he just goes into an ordinary apartment. Yeah. I mean, how would you find him? He's got cash. They have fake names they can use. So how long did he spend up in Sparks, Nevada? Um, six months. That's amazing. That apartment building is probably yep, still probably. there. Someone's, someone's probably living in it, and they have no idea that L. Ron Hubbard hit out in the very apartment they're living mm -hmm, in for six yep. months. You know, and they didn't have a car and while they were up there. They put it in storage. No, they, the car they drove up there, and they put it in storage, and uh, they, you know, walked everywhere. And uh, when they needed money, you know, we had we had um, a system set up of if they needed to contact us, they ran an ad in the personal paper, in the personal classified section. And you'd look for that every day. Yeah, and then you'd really? see the ad. And it was like, okay, you then knew to go to a certain pay phone at a certain hour based off of that ad and wait for the phone call. And then they would tell you how much yeah, money they then, needed? Yeah, and would work out where to meet and uh, so forth. So they, <laughs> that's pretty amazing. So there was always ready cash I wouldn't around. say always ready cash. No, the cash had to be gathered yeah. up. No? Yeah. Oh, I see. What, what, kind, of a, what kind of amounts would they About ask 75, for? 75000 Are you serious? 75000 well, You know, it was so to pay the rent and everything in their living and... He always got nervous if he was running low on, on money, and but he was also very frugal. You would want some walking right. around money, like maybe keep a padding in twenty five, thirty, forty thousand dollars. But back, you know, this this is now in the seventies, and you're asking for seventy five thousand dollars in cash. That's not like petty cash in the drawer in the office. You you do have to. I take your point. You do have to round right. And but when cash. you and he doesn't know how long he's going to be stuck out there with just the three messengers, just the four of them together. So that made him feel more comfortable having that. But as I said, he was very frugal. Yeah, and I've heard that before. He would he would spend money on what he thought was important, but uh, he himself, and, and this leads me to my next question, and I want to set this up for part three uh, on our okay. third interview. When is the first time you meet David Miscavige? What is his post and what's your impression of him? I met him, I guess it was around, well, he just turned 16, 
Uh, 76. He just joined the Sea Org. I met him, and he was just some some teenage boy who had joined the CMO and starting from the bottom going up. I had little to do with him, and then I went off to uh, do the relays while LRH was in Culver City. And then when I returned to Clearwater, I became the commanding officer of the uh, Commodore's Messenger Org in Clearwater, so he was a junior for me. So David Miscavige worked for you, had to call yeah. you sir? Yeah, and um, he was put on a mission. I think this was Sue Pomeroy or someone, but that mission was ended up as a failed mission because all it did was really stat push. And um, that was the only mission I, I can even remember him doing. And then in January of uh, 77, I was asked to send up some messenger trainees to La Quinta. And so I picked David and sent him up there. Yeah, it was around January 77. And um, yeah, and he when I when I arrived myself in April of '77, a few months later, he was there uh, ha as the traffic messenger. Where he didn't actually stand watches running messages with LRH at that time, but all the traffic was filtered through him to cut out any anything that was just a waste of time. I want to leave it there, Janice, for part three. David Miscavige's okay. rise to power and how you come to leave the Commodore's Messenger organization. This is such interesting stuff. Your book, Commodore's Messenger, A Child Adrift in the Scientology Sea Organization, where can people get the book? Yeah, from uh, Amazon.com and Smashword is where they can get the book. Now, it's a, it's a three book series. So this first book only goes till October 1970. And it's already 484 pages. So my next book coming out after this one will cover from October 1970 until October 1975 when we move off the ship. And then the third book will cover when we move into America. Janice, I'm so glad you're writing your trilogy. Because the, especially from your perspective uh, of being so close to L. Ron Hubbard, Mary Sue Hubbard, you know, the rise of David Miscavige, I, I, I think it's a valuable contribution in American religious history, but also to an understanding of the Church of Scientology and the right. man Ron Hubbard. So I, I, I look forward to your book. You sent me some advanced chapters. I'm, I'm a privileged character. I'm glad you sent them to me. And I found them utterly fascinating, uh, especially the way you open the book. <laughs> I won't share it. People, pe but the way you, but the way you open this book, I went, oh my God, is this right. really happening? Right. But yeah. While it was happening, I'm like, is this really happening? So yes, I know what you mean. I want to get the book right away and read through the whole thing. But what I've read so far is a page turner. It's, it's just, it's like we say, Scientology is always worse than you think. So I'm glad you wrote it. Thank you for for doing the two episodes. We look forward to the the third one, which would be. Uh, how David Miscavige's rise to power and some other details about you as CMO and what happens. Okay, again, the book is called Commodore's Messenger, A Child Adrift in the Scientology Sea Organization. Janice Gillum Grady, it's available on Amazon. It is book one of a trilogy. Janice, thank you so much for being on the show. You're very welcome. I've enjoyed our talk. I have too, and I look forward to part three. For Surviving Scientology Radio, this is your host, Jeffrey Augustine. Thank you so much for listening. And as always, we'll be in very good touch.